I cannot see any landscape without the knowledge of the history I have in my head. All what happens is present for me there. Do you want to read the poem? Okay, you want that I read it? Yeah, yeah, please. Ah, also aus Herzen und Hirnen sprießen die Halme der Nacht und ein Wort von Sensen gesprochen neigt sie ins Leben. Stumm wie sie wehen wir der Welt entgegen, unsere Blicke getauscht, um getröstet zu sein, tasten sich vor, winken uns dunkel heran. Blicklos schweigt nun dein Auge in mein Aug sich wandernd. Hab ich dein Herz an die Lippen, hebst du mein Herz an die Deinen. Was wir jetzt trinken, stillt den Durst der Stunden. Was wir jetzt sind, schenken die Stunden der Zeit ein. Munden wir ihr, kein Laut und kein Licht schlüpft zwischen uns, ist zu sagen, o Halme, ihr Halme, O Halme der Nacht. It's difficult to translate. O Halme, O Halme der Nacht. The landscape is not opposite to us. The nature is not opposite to us. The nature is in us. This exhibition came about because of the last exhibition that Kiefer made at the Bourget, which was eight years ago. Kiefer, of course, makes these ravishingly beautiful, heroically scaled landscape paintings and then undermines their beauty, their golden success, by telling us that they're growing out of the sort of bone-rich soil of the First World War and the Second World War. And yet out of that destruction, out of that death, does come regeneration, spring does come again, there is another chance to connect. On its surface, this is an exhibition that is about landscape, about which you've recently been quoted as saying, for me, a landscape is never a landscape. A landscape is always treated, it's bled, destroyed, Landscape for me is the memory of history. In Europe, there's nearly no landscape who is not injured, who had the blood on it, who, who was suffering. For this reason, I use a landscape. Tell me about the exhibition's title, Field of the Cloth of Gold. There is an old painting. It's an event when Henri VIII meets uh, François Premier in near Calais because François Premier was threatened by two sides, by the English and by, by the Autrichian Charlemagne V. They meet in Calais and it was a big representation of gold, you know, to impress each other, you know, as it's still today, like this. They made special clothes for this event in gold, constructed a castle, so for this reason it's known as the field of cloth of gold. This came in my mind as a title for all the paintings. You have the gold in the icons, and it's an old, old medium for the artists. So in the Middle Age, you had paintings where it was all grounded on gold. Kiefer's been using gold as an image for the whole of his career. He's part of a continuum of golden, uplifting spiritual paintings. In his case, the form tends towards the landscapes of history and of memory because that's his voice. Gold doesn't change. I like to change. I like to change my paintings. I, I would say no one painting is finished of mine, even this not. But gold is a state where it's no more changing. So it's a kind of uh, security, but it's very ironic because now the gold is not the guaranteed value of the money. Money is now produced by printing money. So I like to use this 
permanent value is ironic in my paintings. All what you see here is gold was before lead. What was always the aim of the alchemist to, to transform the lead into gold. It's the end of the alchemist's path. You start with something sullen, dark, melancholy, and you melt it and you then turn it into something that we have always used as the image of permanence and of perfection and of God. And in order to achieve his alchemist's effects, Kiefer uses all sorts of unconventional media. I mean, he has been known to chop away at the paintings with an axe. I've seen him working with a blowtorch. I mean, he will cover a painting with straw and then burn it off, like a farmer burning off his fields. He puts them into acid bars, and more importantly, he puts them into electrolysis bars, where you pass an electrical current through the salty water and get a chemical reaction, so great crystals and colors appear out of a sort of alchemy, out of a sort of magic. Now, there are four paintings in the principal part of the exhibition, each of a large scale, 15 and a half feet tall and 27 and a half feet long. Yeah. They are related thematically. They seem to have been conceived in terms of each other. The first one, Sickle Cut. Describe the painting for us. It's a field with weeds. In the sky, there are two uh, sickles. The wheat and the sickle is always a symbol for Eros and Thanatos. It's always a symbol for the death. And these two sickles, they are the Sichelschnitt. Sichelschnitt, this was the plan to make the war against France. The German troops was going through the Ardennes. The Ardennes was impossible to go through, but the Germans did it. And this was the, the beginning of the big, big disaster. If this wouldn't have happened, France wouldn't be occupied. Hitler's war would be finished then, you know. Describe the seven bowls of wrath for us, referring to God's wrath. There is a, a field of, of weeds and then there is dropping down very thick shellac and these shellac are like the seven bowls of catastrophe. If it goes down more and more, the, the wheat will be suffocated and it will be disappear. The third painting, called Axe Age, Wolf Age, is taken, I gather, from the first poem of the Norse myths. And it reads like this, Axe time, sword time, shields are sundered, wind time, wolf time, ere the world falls. Yeah. Another apocalyptic picture. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. You see the axe, and the axe goes out of the earth. The disaster is already in the earth. It's already proclamated. There are different interpretations, you know, of a painting, and each one can have his own interpretation. I'm happy if someone has an interpretation I didn't think about. Somebody told me it's like the, the blind people in the Bruegel painting, you know? Uh, okay, you can, you can see this. Or I could think also on the Le Bourgeois de Calais, who march one after the other and give the key to Calais. Were they conceived together to be seen together? Yes, I made them for, uh, for this room. Here you cannot put some small paintings in, it would be a little bit ridiculous. They're magisterial in scale, but also in content. For me, it's not so large. It's my, my gesture. I dance in front of the painting, you know?
another part of the exhibition is a series of books that you've made. Yeah, yeah. Bookmaking has been a very important part of your artistic practice. Do you like equally the content of the book as well as the making of the book? Tell us about your book practice. 60% of my work is still doing books, you know. Painting, you see immediately. It's an apparition, you know, then it's there. But a book, it takes time. And when I do books, I develop ideas for a painting, you know, because you turn the pages and something is going on, what brings you to another field, you know. Hello, all the photos who are in this book are made when I had the show here in um, 2012. When Larry opened the gallery, I did the first show here and it was called Morgenthau Plan. And it was a big field here with wheat and Morgenthau was the foreign minister of Roosevelt. And he was so catastrophized by the Germans' politics that he wanted the Germans farmers, nothing else than farmers, no more railway, no more factories. And this was a big chance for Goebbels, you know, to, to tell to the Germans, if you don't find, you will, you will end up all just as farmers, you know. It was counterproductive. And I made some works about the Morgenthau plan. I made photos of this exhibition with all the weeds and then I projected it on a gold leaf page. The point about Morgenthau plan is not the plan. Kiefer uses that image and that title to take a bucolic agrarian dream of lovely nature and to say the world is more complicated than that and that these lovely fields are actually graveyards and you have to know that, you have to remember it. Kiefer, born in the last year of the war, growing up, realized that there was a sort of omerta, there was a silence that no one was really addressing. It's about looking at things straight in the eye, looking history straight in the eye, or else nothing means anything. There's an obvious association, it seems to me, between your paintings as conceived as you create wheat fields and Van Gogh's painting, his late painting of wheat fields with crows. You've been thinking more and more, it seems, about Van Gogh and about the gold ground of his paintings. You dedicated one of the paintings in the exhibition to Van Gogh, the cornfield with scythe. Why that particular painting? Why not other paintings in the exhibition? Oh, I, I could have dedicated them all, but it would be very boring, no? So I thought, oh, it's like the painting with a sickle, you know, the man with a little sickle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In English translation, wheat field with a reaper. Yeah. It's painted in 1889, and you said that this painting is like a gold ground icon, like the sunflower paintings. He thought on, the, on icons when he did the sunflowers because it's all gold. It has something utopic, the gold, you know. But it's also a certain uh, utopian relief for him. Do you think? It was his conditio sine qua non, his condition to be alive. It was always a human tragedy. He could survive in, in creating these things, but otherwise he wouldn't have survived, it's clear. There's a degree of empathy with Van Gogh in that Van Gogh builds his art. He isn't an effortlessly gifted painter like Manet. I mean, Manet and Velazquez you feel like they were just born to paint, that they, they have this extraordinary facility. Whereas uh, painters like Van Gogh and Kiefer have to wring their images out of the paint. They have to build their paintings. They have to construct them. You say that the straw in your work was inspired by Ceylon's poem, Death Fugue. Yeah. There are two collections, of early collections of poems by Ceylon that sound so much like your paintings. The first one, Sand from the Urns. Sand aus den Urnen, yes. And Poppy and Memory. Moon und Gedächtnis. When did you first read Ceylon? It was in school even, you know. They are with me. In the 80s I made a lot of paintings connotated with this poem of Ceylon. Could you recite the poem for us? Dein goldenes Haar, Margarete, dein aschenes Haar, Sulamit. Schwarze Milch, wir trinken dich des Morgens, wir trinken dich des Abends, wir trinken und trinken. You know, the wheat fields in Germany, they 
I had always the illusion with the golden hair of Margaret, you know. Now you said that language is not to signify something, but to uplift a whole other world. Poems are not just another world, but the world itself, as opposed to everything that surrounds, for all this is only an illusion. I think that all what we see around us, when we speak normally now and look around, it doesn't exist really. What, what exists for me really is only the poetry. Because this is a language, a concentrated language, and I live through these poems, you know. If I don't have these poems, I go under. What will survive is the art and not the world. Je pense toujours à la mort. Moi, je crois que je suis une partie dans le cosmos. Une petite, petite. Tu peux imaginer ça? Et tu es composé de ces très petits trucs, et ces très petits trucs sont dans le cosmos aussi. Alors tu fais partie de ce, tous ces petits, petits choses. Alors, une fois, quand tu es mort, Ça change pas trop, parce que les petits, petits, petits trucs, ils sont là toujours. Comprends? 